We're nearing the end of our eight-week series on times of peril. I think it's an important series because we all face difficulties. And when we go through hard times, where do we turn? What do we do? Because sometimes we feel like we've been left all alone in a world that doesn't want to do anything but beat up on us. Are you with me in this? It's that way sometimes. Where do we turn? What do we do? Well, when God's people encounter peril, they need to pray to God. If they pray, He will provide, and then we will give Him praise. That's what we've been seeing in this eight-week series every week, have we not? A time of peril, leading to prayer, leading to God's provision to solve the problem, and then the praise of God's people because of what He's done. We followed the children of Israel from Egypt to the land of Canaan. After more than 400 years of slavery, they were finally free. And God was leading them out. Moses was taking them out, and they were happy to go. But then Pharaoh changed his mind while they were crossing the Sinai Peninsula, and he chased them down with his army. And he caught up with them right on the beach where there's a big mountain range behind them, the nine and a half miles of, of very deep water in front of them, and the only path down to that beach was filled with Roman soldiers, Egyptian soldiers. Sorry, Romans. <laughs> Egyptian soldiers. It's a bad time. And so they prayed, and God provided a miracle. Did he not? Yes, yes. Part of the water, they walked through on dry ground, the Egyptians said, we're going to get you. They came riding down into that, uh, that little pathway that God had created, and the waters came down on them. And the children of Israel were standing on this other bank, and they're looking back and looking at the miraculous provision of God. And i got to think that some of them in that congregation would be saying, praise God for what he's done. We also stood in the gates of Jerusalem, when the people were surrounded by the massive army of Sennacherib and the Assyrians, they came to conquer Jerusalem and destroy the nation of Judah. It's a terrible time for the people of Jerusalem. They're living inside the city and they can't even get outside the walls. They prayed. God answered. He sent out an angel in the middle of the night and he slaughtered 185,000 soldiers in that field out in front of the city and saved the Jewish people. And I would think the church would say, praise God. Wouldn't the church say that? Yes. Oh, yes. We didn't say it. Praise, praise God. God. Thank you. Just need some help here from time to time. Thirdly, we stood on the top of Mount Carmel and we witnessed the God test between Elijah and the 850 pagan prophets of Baal and the Asherah. And, um, boy, I'll tell you, Elijah had some guts. Well, actually, he had a God. And he said, let's find out who the true God is. And so they built altars. You know the story, I won't go through the whole thing. I will say this, that he was tremendously outnumbered, but he prayed and God answered and it was very clear to everyone who the true God of Israel really is. Correct? Yes. God was doing some great things. You kind of have a time of peril. You need to pray. That's the first thing you should do. Instead of complaining, we need to pray. And then there was a surprise attack on Jerusalem from the three nations located across the Jericho River. They were completely outnumbered. They were coming up from a place where they would never have expected so that they could take the city by surprise. Some of the Jewish people saw those soldiers amassing down to the south. They came into the city and told the king about it. And he got all of the people together and they started doing what? Praying. Praying. And they prayed. And God answered. And he said, I'm going to give you a victory and you're not even going to have to fight. I just want you to walk outside the city gates and see what I'm going to do. And I don't want the military to go out first. I don't want it to look like we think we're going to be able to defend ourselves. I want you to send the choir out first. No one's going to be afraid of the choir. Unless they have tubas or something with them. They might be able to cause some damage. So they went out praising God. And they stood out in that field. And the enemy got confused. 
and they fought against each other and completely annihilated each other's armies. And the children of Israel walked over to the left, looked down to the cliff a little bit and they saw they're all dead. So they picked up all the bounty from the stuff that was left behind and went back to the city praising God. They prayed, God answered, and they rejoiced. Correct? What a great, great story. And then the nation was challenged again, this time by the mighty Philistines. And the Philistines became a problem for them. And their giant warrior, who was? David. Goliath. Goliath, yes. David was the minuscule warrior for the other side. Goliath. And Goliath comes out for 40 days and 40 nights. He is challenging the people of Israel. Send out a warrior to fight against me one-on-one -on -one in the winter take all. There's no reason for all of us to fight, but just send someone out here. The Bible says he was 9 feet 6 inches tall. And he was very strong. This is a great big ugly guy. He had to be ugly. But you wouldn't say that to him. <laughs> David comes out because his dad said, go check on your brothers. He had three brothers in the military. Go see how they're doing and how the battle is coming. There hadn't been a battle yet because Goliath kept challenging everyone. And David's three brothers were hiding under the blanket. <laughs> they weren't happy that he was there. David prayed. Then he volunteered. I can kill this giant. And the king looked at him and said, you got to be kidding me. He said, hey, I'm a shepherd. There was a bear that took one of my sheep, and I fought and killed that bear. I grabbed him by the beard and beat the snot out of him. And that's not exact, That's not the Hebrew text, but that's kind of what he said. That's a translation. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a paraphrase. It's a living book. Yeah. And then he said, then a lion came on one day and took one of my sheep, and I chased it down. I grabbed him by the beard and beat him too. And if I can beat a lion and a bear, I can take on this ugly Philistine. Of course. Well, the king didn't have anyone else to send out there. He said, well, we'll pray that God will be with you. Well, God was with him. Indeed. One stone right into the forehead. And then go over there and pick up the sword and cut off his head. And that battle was over. And God provided a stunning victory. And the people should have celebrated and said, Amen. Wouldn't they say that? Wouldn't you say that? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. Last week, we caught up with Simon Peter, who had been arrested and cast into the high-security prison awaiting execution. This was a tense time for the church. They had recently killed our Lord. And then they reached out and had Stephen killed. And then James, the brother of John, was murdered. And then they got Simon Peter because Herod found out that, you know, the Jewish people think this is really cool that I'm killing church members, so I might as well kill all of them. Let me find their leaders first. And so he put Peter in prison, and he was chained to two guards. Not a good place to be. And two other guards at the gate of his little cell. Now, these are powerful fighting men. They are trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. King would have been secure, thinking that they could keep that prisoner for a short period of time. Well, God intervened. And an angel came in and woke Simon Peter up and said, Hey, let's go. His chains fell off his hands and off of his ankles. He said, Let's go be quiet. So he takes him through the, uh, through the prison and out into the city streets. And he says, Okay, you're free to go. And then the angel disappeared. All that time, Simon Peter thought he was just dreaming. This can't be true. But now he's standing out there in the street, and he knows it's true because, hey, I'm actually out here, and there's no one around. So he went to the house of some church members who were praying, and they were not really excited about it because they didn't believe it had happened. He can't be out at the door. And the girl that answered the door wrote and said, yes, he is. He's out there. No, no, no. They finally went to the door and said, oh, they were shocked. Why are we shocked when God answers prayer? Christian leadership is a holy calling. If one is uncertain of the fact, they will never survive a life in ministry. Give me that next slide, if you would, Court. Where we're going today is to look at the Apostle Paul at a time when he went through a lot of punishment. But I want you to see a time when he went through a period of disrespect that created a tremendous hardship for him 
And we're going to see that as we get into this more. Christian leadership is a holy calling. If God hasn't called you to it, you don't need to be in it. That's all there is to it. Because the only way you're going to survive is by the grace of God. Because you will run into a situation where uh, the, the sheep are biting and you just need to get out of the way. And so if you're not called by God, you don't need to be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not easy sometimes. And so uh, today I want to focus on overcoming spiritual attack. Now that can come from one of two directions. It can come from outside the church. And the Apostle Paul had a lot of opposition from outside the church, did he not? Yes, he did. You know, in my 50 years of pastoral <clears throat> ministry, I've had almost no hostility from people in the community. Even when I go out and knock on the doors, sharing the gospel, that kind of never had a problem with the people in the community. Was, I, I had one person that was obnoxious to me. He was another pastor. <laughs> he was upset with me because... The Baptist Church and the Church of Christ used to have uh, conflict with one another, theologically. I don't care about that stuff, but though some people do, and clearly this pastor did. When I knocked on his door, he said, I introduced myself, and he was very upset. He said, what are you doing at my door? I said, I just wanted to meet you and invite you to church, talk with you a little bit. And he said, I pastor a church. And he told me the church, and I went, oh, okay. I knew where the hostility was coming from then. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you guys don't even preach the gospel. And I said, have you been to our church? He said, I don't have to go to your church. You're a Baptist, ain't you? And I said, yeah, but I do preach the gospel. Anyway, a little bit of external stuff. But in my lifetime, the major conflicts I have faced have been within the fellowship. That's where the big problem comes from. So... I want to look at Paul's external attack first, because it was significant. He went through a lot of difficulty. Are you with me in this? You know, you probably know some of these stories, but I just want to read, because he gives a synopsis of those things, because he was under so much pressure from the people in Corinth that he finally said, I feel foolish to do this, but I'm going to tell you what I've been through, because they were acting like he had no business uh, being in the ministry at all. He wanted to show them that's just not true. So let's look at the text and see what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. That's substantial. Why did they only give 39 lashes? They believed that the 40th lash would kill a person. What does 39 lashes do? It thrashes your body and causes intense pain. Yes? Very much. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. How would you like to be in the water? You can't get out of there and it's dark. And I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, Dangers among false brethren who'd like to travel with Paul. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. The external pressure on Paul was severe and ongoing, yes? Mm -hmm. Not many people could take that kind of beating. In fact, there was one young man that went with him on his first missionary journey, and they went to the first city, and he left and went back home. And people wonder why Paul would not take him with them the next time they went out. Because when you're going through that, you need to have people you can trust. Yes. People who will stand with you. The external, external pressure was severe. He was often, often traveling, so he was out in the elements, and there were animals, and, and the weather can be uh, really interesting, like it is for us today. And so he went through a lot of hardships out there. He faced hostility from the Jews, from the pagans. He'd go into a pagan city and they'd be mad because no one's buying their little gods that they made anymore because he's preaching on a god that doesn't have to have a shape. And the Romans. It took courage and perseverance for the apostle to complete his mission. And you have to admire his fortitude, don't you think? Yes. But I want to concentrate on another angle in Paul's life. 
another direction from which he was receiving a tremendous amount of heat. And it's kind of shocking to me, but after 50 years in the pastorate, I understand it, but I think I've elevated Apostle Paul to such a position that I think, man, anyone would respect him, yeah, you think, yeah? Yeah, yeah we think that. Anyway, I want to concentrate the rest of our study on that other type of suffering, that which comes from within the church, specifically for him, the church at Corinth. There were some problems there, and when he writes letters to them, you can sense the hurt, you can sense the pain that he's experiencing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, listen to this. <coughs> Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. The heaviest thing on his heart was not who was around the corner that might beat him up. The heaviest thing on his heart was the churches and how they were struggling and how badly he wanted to establish churches and get them to grow and to be uh, prominent. He uses two words there, the word pressure, that which comes upon you or rises up from within. I know that um, pastors at times feel a real heavy burden for where their church is. Not the location, but the spiritual condition of the church and what's going on in the body of Christ. And that can bring daily pressure to a pastor, trying to pray through and work through those kinds of things. And then he uses the word concern. The word concern means careful or anxious concern, and it carries with it the sense of sorrow. Why did Paul have sorrow as he looked at the church? Because there were some things going on in the church that did not glorify God and did not promote his gospel and was not going to help the world. And so he was burdened by that, and he said, it's the daily pressure of dealing with the churches and knowing what's going on inside the church. So Paul took his ministry seriously. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. I want you to follow with me on this text. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, in this case, moreover, it is required that stewards of stewards that one be found what? Trustworthy. trustworthy. It needs to be trustworthy. Now Paul uses some words there to describe how he understands his position. When he refers to servants, he's talking about himself as a servant of God. Are you with me? So he said the servant's job is to do anything which is controlled by the will of him to whom it is rendered. In other words, there is a master. If you're the servant, there's a master. Who's the master? Well, it's not the chairman of the deacons or the women's missionary organization. It's God. The Lord is our master. And so the pastor has to understand that as a servant of God, he answers to God for what he does. And it doesn't matter what other people think about it. He, know, he needs to know that in his heart he is being obedient to what God has called him to do. Then he uses the word steward. A steward is a manager to whom the head of the house or proprietor has entrusted the management of his affairs. And once again, this is a relationship where someone has a boss that he answers to and he manages those affairs on behalf of that boss. And the boss, once again, is the Lord. And he said it's important for a servant and a steward to be trustworthy. And that word means faithful in the transaction of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. Whatever you do, boy, you better be doing what God called you to do. Because if you do what other people tell you to do instead of what God tells you to do, you got trouble. If you think you had trouble with the church when they didn't like what you were doing, that's nothing compared to what it's going to be like if the minister's not doing what God called him to do. Now, I've been the pastor for 50 years almost. I've been in six churches, I believe, in that period of time. Some longer than others. In every one of those churches, I believe when I went there that God had called me to that church and that I had a responsibility to God to lead that church, to preach the word, to minister to the people and do the best I could to help that church to grow. And that is a burden that we carry. 
And it never goes away. It's with you every day, every moment. And when other people are telling you, you need to do this, Pastor, you need to do that, and you're thinking, you know what, I'm doing what God called me to do. And it's biblical. And the Holy Spirit is confirming to me, this is the path I want you on. Other people don't always understand the path that God has for the pastor. And so it can become difficult. Paul faced severe and ongoing criticism, disrespect, and opposition from within the church at Corinth. Why was there such a disconnect in that church? Because it doesn't appear to be true in the other churches he went to. They respected him. The churches were growing. They were pleased, and God was doing some great things. But Corinth was a special thing. And the apostles struggled with that. And I'll tell you what, pastors today who study this word, and they read about Paul and his situation with Corinth. It helps them to deal with their own situation. Because if it could happen to Paul, it can certainly happen to me. Yes? Yes. And so we just have to deal with it. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But to me, listen carefully to this statement. To me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you. Or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Now, that tells me that the apostle has been facing some heat from that church, correct or not? Yep. Correct. He would not say to the church, it's a small thing to me that I'm being examined by you. What does it mean that they are examining him? They are critiquing the things that he's doing. And they're judging him based upon that. The word examined means to investigate, just like you would in a court of law investigate. See what you can find. And sometimes there are church members who are investigating, finding some, oh, the pastor did that. Oh, he said that. Did you hear what he said? So we got all this information we gather. <coughs> then you find yourself in front of a very unfriendly committee. Yes. And they don't like you as much as God does. <laughs> means to investigate. It's used of the judicial process, and now it's used of informal, in-house investigations in the church. Paul said, I'm not overly concerned about that. Next verse. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Amen. Amen. If God is criticizing him and telling him you need to change your direction, he needs to listen to God and change his direction. That's right. But if God is confirming the direction, then he needs to stay on course and not let the pressure move him off of that course. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. Therefore, listen to what he says, do not go on passing judgment. That says to me, this is an ongoing process. Do not go on doing this. Because they had been doing it, and it was driving them nuts. And that's okay, because most pastors are pretty close to nuts when we start. <laughs> do not go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Do not go on passing judgment, but wait until the end and we'll know then what God thinks. That's quite a verse. Paul was talking to the church. He uses two words, examine, which means to investigate, and judge, which means to condemn, to call into question, to contend with, to criticize. That's what he was facing at Corinth. And wait till you find out what they were criticizing him over. It's amazing. And I think that Paul is an extraordinary example of the Christian faith. I do. I think we should all hold him in high esteem, don't you think? But they didn't in Corinth. Now look at this group and tell me if this is a happy looking group. <laughs> look at the faces. That's the church committee. I don't know that it was the pastoral investigation committee, but I put that on there because it could have been. It could have been. And if anyone has ever sat in front of a committee like that, when everyone has a sour look on their face and everyone's angry and they all have complaints and they want to throw them into the pastor's face, it's not a fun place to be. I've been there. I know what it's like. And I love God enough to continue in the work despite that. And that doesn't happen to me every day, but it's happened. And it's happened to every pastor I've ever known. One of the criticisms of the Apostle Paul in the church of Corinth was that he was an inferior preacher. Okay, can you imagine? The Apostle Paul was an inferior preacher. They said they weren't impressed. Like, you know what? If I was Paul, I don't care if you're impressed or not. Learn something. But oh my goodness, 
they didn't think he was a very good preacher. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5. Listen to this. He says, I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. He was comfortable with who he was and what he was doing. Next verse. But even if I am unskilled in speech, and that's what they were saying, he's unskilled in speech. Well, if he was unskilled in speech, I have no idea what I am. Yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. Unskilled. It's an interesting Greek word. Let me pronounce it for you. Idiotes. <laughs> Does that sound like an English word? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Oh, you guys are such scholars. I know. They thought he was an idiot in his preaching. Oh my goodness. Unskilled. That's what it means. It's unlearned, illiterate. A man as opposed to the learned and educated. He was a very poor speaker. Now, I never heard the Apostle Paul preach, but I've read some of his sermons. He was pretty good. And to say that he was illiterate and unlearned, that is absolutely preposterous. Don't you think? Yes. yes. Just unbelievably stupid. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is what? Unimpressive. Unimpressive. And his speech? Contemptible. contemptible. Wow. The Apostle Paul. And I thought I had to really improve my preaching ability to serve in a church. No, I don't have to. I could be contemptible and unimpressive. <laughs> you say you are. Check. Well, then I've accomplished that. <laughs> unimpressive, weak and feeble. Contemptible. It means he is despised. He is of no account. When he speaks, nobody wants to hear it. They don't want to listen to him preach. And they would rather hear just about anyone besides the Apostle Paul. Well, thank you, church. It's interesting because Paul was extremely well-educated. He wrote in Koine Greek, and I mean beautifully. He studied under Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the primary scholar in the Jewish faith at that time, and he studied directly under Rabbi Gamaliel. He had a strong command of the Jewish scriptures, and he was very effective in ministry because everywhere he went, people were saved and churches were established. So for a guy who's a lousy preacher and unimpressive, he sure has a good background, doesn't he? How can this guy come off as uneducated? It doesn't matter what kind of education you have. If someone's angry, they can say whatever. They did that to him. He wrote 28% of the New Testament. I can't wait till we get to heaven and meet some of the, the members of the church at Corinth. <laughs> Explain this to me, would you please? Just let me know what you guys were thinking. I think the Apostle Paul was enormously qualified. Yet there were some in Corinth who disparaged his preaching. They were not impressed. They liked Apollos more. He's a better preacher than you. We'd rather hear him. So don't come back here. Leave Apollos with us. Well, Apollos was a young man who didn't know a whole lot. He knew the Jewish scriptures very well. But he was just learning the Christian faith. And he needed some help from some of Paul's missionary friends in order to get, to, to get his stuff together so he understood the Christian faith properly. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, that's Simon Peter, and I of Christ. Now we have four groups in the church. I guess the one, I'm of Christ, is the highest ranking one, okay? We are of Christ. Some said they were Paul, they liked what he was doing, they believed in what he was doing. Some said, oh, you know what, we like Apollos. Some said Cephas, is it, is it impossible to imagine a church split like that? No. no. On personalities? No. Oh, we like this preacher more than that preacher. Oh, we like this staff member more than that staff member. And it goes back and forth, and, and you think, my goodness, how does the body of Christ ever do anything with all the nonsense that goes on inside churches? It's unbelievable. The church was divided over personalities. That doesn't glorify God. It doesn't further his kingdom. In fact, if anything, it makes the church an ugly place for people to visit. A lost person comes into a church and people are making ratty remarks about one another. 
They can sense the hostility between some of these people. They feel it in the service and no one greets them. They walk out the door and they say, man, I don't want to go back there again. Is that right? I've been to those places. Hey, I semi-retired from California, came to Texas. I was going to relax. That didn't last very long. But I visited a lot of Baptist churches. And I saw some really interesting things, like no one greeting you. Walk in the door, sit in the third pew. Have a baptism. The staff member did the baptism, comes down and sits right in front of you. So you know he's on staff. They had a handshaking time, so the church stood up, and he turned and looked at me, and he goes, Ooh! like I was a monster or something. Which, I mean, I was wearing makeup. So <laughs> Anyway, so he walks off, doesn't greet me, doesn't say anything to me. He just goes off, shakes hands with the friends, comes back, sits in front of us, and never said another word. At the end of the service, never greeted us, never asked us to come back, nothing. And I thought, wow, this is the most unfriendly place I've ever been. Not one person greeted us. Now, we had several people push their way by us in the aisle to get to their friend and then push their way by as they go. They were friendly to their friends. Yeah. They're not friendly to everybody. That's right. And I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, you get to Texas, boy, that's a friendly place. They're friendly to their friends. They're not always friendly to everybody else. Are you with me in this? Yes. Paul was experiencing that. Boy, he sees the church with all these different little groups. We'll never accomplish anything that way. Those people, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, all were serving the same Lord. We need to get it together. Acts 18, verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. That's the Old Testament Scriptures. But he had gotten saved, and he started preaching, and he was an eloquent man. Paul is unimpressive. Apollos is eloquent. Apollos doesn't know a tenth of what Paul knows. But he's a pretty good preacher. So they thought Paul was a goofball like this guy. Anyone recognize him? Anyone recognize him? Tommy, 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 Tommy. No, Stan Laurel. Hardy. Lauren Hardy. Yeah, remember Hardy. Laurel and Hardy? <laughs> Blew my whole sermon on that one slide. <laughs> well, you should have made it bigger, so I said. <laughs> so Paul must have appeared to some of the great scholars in the church as an idiot. Simply didn't impress them. But their criticism didn't stop there. There's another thing they were critical of. And this is equally painful to him. They also believed that Paul and his team were unworthy of financial support as they served in the church. Now, when Paul came to Corinth, there was no church. He started reaching people. He started the church. The church never offered to help him in his ministry financially so he could continue to build that church. They never offered. And he never asked them for anything. But they were critical of this matter of financial support. They certainly didn't offer him any assistance. He didn't request it. Um, this is one way that many churches today try to control their staff by their budgeting. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And they can really hurt you. I mean, financially, they can really hurt you. It was funny because the fastest growing church that I ever pastored was in Kansas. And... A friend of mine from college was the owner of a bank in town, and he was the chairman of their pulpit committee. He called me one day in California. The church I was in had tripled while I was there. I loved that church. Best church I'd ever been in. It was just awesome. He said, God wants you to come to Kansas and pastor our church. I said, I haven't got that message. <laughs> he said, yeah, but I think if you pray about it, he will, because our church is just struggling. He said, we have not hit 200 in Sunday school, and we have tried and tried and tried, and whatever we do, we can't hit 200. We need somebody to come here and get us to 200 in Sunday school. Can you do that? And I thought, wow, what a mark. I mean, goodness, if we can't hit 200. So anyway, he called, and he kept calling me for six months. And finally we felt, well, maybe the Lord is in this. And so we went out there. And in a year and a half, that church hit 200, we hit 300, we hit 400, 425 in Sunday school, and 675 in worship. Wow. That's pretty good. The banker called me up one day and asked me and my associate pastor to come to the bank to talk with him. We did. Sat down in his beautiful, luxurious 
conference room. And he said, Pastor, why do you think the church is in decline? And I said, <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair. I said, are you kidding me? This is the guy that was saying we can never hit 200. And we, were, we had averaged 386 in Sunday school for the last six months. It's in decline. I said, it's not in decline. Doug, you may, you may need to wake up and look around. Maybe walk from class to class. We had nine classes at the high school across the street. We had four in the church foyer, six in the gymnasium, one in the kitchen, and one in the youth minister's office. And that was a problem because he would always work out during the week and leave his stinky sweats in his office. <laughs> and it was a little old ladies class, and they would come, Pastor, it smells so bad in there. So we had to deal with that. <laughs> Somebody getting <didn't> called? <laughs> Tell them the preacher's droning on. <laughs> anyway. So we go to that church, and uh, they were just smoking hot. And the thing that was always amazing to me, that we come to the, the uh, budget process each year. And I would sit in on the budget meeting with them, and I remember very graphically the first year they said, Well, Pastor, you know, Mr. Jones over here didn't get a raise at his job this year. I don't think we can give raises to our staff because... You know, that wouldn't look good if we're giving raises and he's not getting one. I thought, okay, I've never heard that argument before. The next year, well, Mr. Jones got a raise and Mr. Williams did not. So I don't see how we can give raises to us. And now, the, I talked about the Sunday school growth and stuff. The offerings were dramatically higher. I mean, the church would bring in more money than they'd ever brought in. We can't give raises to the staff because, you know, it just wouldn't be right. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a struggle. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3. Listen to what they talk about here. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Yes, you do, Paul. Just like everyone else. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? They were taking their wives with them as they were traveling around. He said there's nothing wrong with that. We don't do that. They wasn't married, evidently. Or do only Barnabas and I not have the right to refrain from working? Are we the only two apostles out there doing the work of God that don't have the right to not work in a secular job, but instead to just work in the body of Christ? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I mean, he said in every, and he went on to give a lot of other examples of people in different fields and how what they produced in their work provided some benefit to them so they could provide for their family. We understand that, don't we? It's not hard to understand. Should a minister receive financial support from those whom he serves? Well, Paul is saying they should, but he wasn't going to accept any money from them. And... Just to make sure you understand this, I'm not preaching this sermon because I want to get a raise, okay? I'm not, I don't think that at all. I've never asked for a raise. But let me say this. I did ask for some gas money once. Uh, but the reason I'm saying this is because this is what Paul was going through and this is what a lot of pastors go through today in the church. So it's a difficult subject. It's a sensitive subject. I've pastored for almost 50 years, and it is my calling, and I can't get away from it. It drove me nuts. When I was not pastoring, I was at home in the middle of the night writing sermons that I would never preach because it's just part of who I am. I lay down, and I start thinking about text, and, oh, man, it's driving me nuts. I better go and prepare something. Otherwise, I'll never sleep. And it was driving me nuts. And I couldn't teach a Sunday school class in any of the Baptist churches I visited. They wouldn't even let me teach Sunday school. So I was going nuts at that point. But that's if you know me, you know I'm not far from nuts anyway. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. That's a basic principle that Paul says. That's what the Lord has directed us to do. So if someone is, is, is ministering in a church, they should receive their sustenance from the church. So we do that through free will offerings. Now, I'm showing you that because that's the only offering plate you're going to see put in front of your face. We have one back there and one up here. We don't pass the plate, and I'll tell you why. Because we're a bunch of senior adults, and we have limited income. And I don't want you to feel pressured, ever, that you have to put something in the offering plate. If you do that, you do it of your own free will, because you want to do it. 
and it's never because the pastor made you feel guilty, and I'm not trying to make you feel guilty today. So if you take that away from this sermon, that's, that's not where I'm headed. I just want you to know that, that that's where ministers get their support. It comes from the church to some degree. So that's a very basic principle. And um, Paul demonstrated that uh, when you don't have that support, you can do some creative things to survive. And I'll tell you what he did. He had a previous occupation. He was a tent maker. And when he came to Corinth, he met two other Christians, a husband and wife, who were tent makers also. And so when he came to Corinth, he had no support coming in. So the three of them started making and selling tents. And they were doing quite well, taking care of their needs. Until two more of the apostles came from Macedonia down to see them. And at that point, they stopped that external work and started doing focusing more completely on the ministry work. Well, what happened when those two guys showed up? Acts 18, verse 1. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, and a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he came to them because he was of the same trade. He stayed with them, and they were working, making tents and selling them, yes? For by trade, they were tent makers. That's what they were doing. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, he couldn't work. So on the Sabbath, he went to the place of worship where the Jews would gather, and he proclaimed the gospel there and ministered to people there. And he was trying to persuade both Jews and Greeks about the gospel. And so the apostle, uh, he, he was doing the work that he could to provide for himself until the other apostles showed up in verse 5. Let's see what happens. Verse 5. There's no verse 5? Oh, here we go. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word. What does that mean? Full-time ministry now, not part-time ministry, not working as a tent salesman and then working a little bit here on the side in ministry. Now he forgot about tent making and he devoted himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And so he began doing that ministry full-time. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. He was able to do that. Why? Because some money was given in Macedonia to help them in Corinth. Why in the world would a church in Macedonia collect money? Folks, the money you make is hard-earned money. Even if you're retired, it is the fruit of your labor, and that's what you get. And there's nothing, uh, there's no explosions of, of fresh money coming into the pot, right? right? Unless you're very different from me. So I understand that. But, uh, but in this church, Paul was devoting himself now full-time to work because his church in Macedonia provided financial support to assist the church in Corinth to complete their ministry. So the money came from Macedonia. We do the same thing today. We raise money for missions, do we not? All over the world. And we pay for missions all over the world. That's correct. And... It's a, it's a thing we do because we believe it's necessary. But that missionary that goes out there needs to have something for his family. He's got to be able to live. Mm -hmm. And when he gets out there, you know, he's going to be in some difficult situations. He needs to be able to focus on that without not having to worry about the money and being able to pay his bills. Are you with me? That's right. And so when they came down from Macedonia, they brought some money. In fact, there's a couple places in the New Testament, I'm not going to read them today, where he commends the Macedonians because of their generosity in supporting God's work. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them in order to serve you. Now, he wasn't robbing the church. He's just simply saying, I was willing to take money from another church in order to serve you. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need, and in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you, and will continue to do so. Paul did not ask them for money before. He's not asking them for money now. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Let me show you a map. See where Macedonia is at the top of that map? See where Corinth is down there? It's a pretty good little walking distance. Why do they care about that church in Corinth? Because those people have been saved, they've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and they want other people to know that joy too. 
That's why they raised money and sent it down to Corinth to help with that work. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. Just a couple more verses. If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we, did never, we never used this right. We never demanded help. But we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. We endure. We do the best we can. We sell tents if we have to because we do not want to hinder the gospel. Next verse, verse 15. But I have used none of these things, and I'm not writing these things so that it will be done so. In my case, it would be better for me to die than to, than to have any man make my boast an empty one. Paul keeps saying, I'm not asking for anything from you, but a little bit of respect would have been good. Verse 18. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right, with the gospel. And when he says he preaches so that people can receive the gospel free of charge, he's saying, I do not put the importance of that person's salvation on a money right. value where I have to have a certain amount of money. I'm not going to tell this person about Jesus. That's insane. It is. Paul started a lot of churches, did he not? He did. Yeah. He did. In the midst of the heartache that he had in the church, he was able to be settled in his own mind and heart, love the body of Christ, love the Lord, love the lost, and keep doing the work of God. Give me the next slide, Court. Maintaining a thankful heart when ministry hurts. I'll tell you this, I am so grateful for this church. I enjoy so much coming here and preaching and, and fellowshipping with you guys. Uh, it's not a perfect church, I'm sure. Someone might be able to come in and see something wrong. I don't know what it is. It'd probably be me. But, but yeah, 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 that's it. I've only... Um, I, I'm not even going to make that comment. I'm not going to make that comment. If you'd asked me four years ago, would I be at this church four years later? I would say probably not. It wasn't looking good. And I can tell you this, I'm so grateful that God worked through that situation, not because I was desperate, but because there's some precious people that were in this church that deserved better. Yes. And God kept us here. Yes. And we are what we are. But we started with a very, very small group. Yes. And God has been blessing us. And the people he brings are the most brilliant people in town. It's just amazing how smart they are. And every one of them, every single person who visits, I go, oh my word, this person has such an IQ. They are so deeply spiritual. They need to be in our church. That's, I mean, I just assume that. And if they put up with my preaching, then they're welcome. <laughs> A thankful heart, even in the midst of heartache. Amen. When you're struggling, you just love God and you love your way through it. And you hope and pray that God will deal with the issues so that you can continue to serve Him. Amen. And I'm so grateful that I do not wake up in the middle of the night working on a sermon I won't preach. I do actually work on sermons that I will preach. Amen. And I'm grateful. Even when ministry hurts. Stand with me. We're going to sing our invitation hymn. Ministry does hurt sometimes. We don't want to hear that. Because we don't want to think that um, we have in any way created hurtful situations, but the church is what it is. And no church is perfect. But you know who is perfect? The Lord is perfect. And He loves you and He loves me. And if we follow Him, we're going to set aside a lot of the pettiness that disturbs most churches and just love one another and love the Lord. And God's going to do something special. And that's where we are, I think. And I'm glad for that. Because I'm not embarrassed when someone visits this church. I don't have to explain to them, oh, well, you got to understand. You know, Billy's a wild man. you got to understand that. <laughs> God has provided, and he's provided, he's provided good people that love the Lord. And we are a family. We're a body of Christ. Are we not? And we'd love to see the body grow. Let's pray. Father, thank you.